Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. Is the Nano a miracle of modern manufacturing which makes cheap cars available to millions? Or is it in the Indian situation a potential nightmare that could create unacceptable pollution and urban congestion? That's the key issue I shall discuss today with the director for the Center of Science and Environment and a lady that many consider the conscience keeper of India, Sunita Narayan. Sunita Narayan, when Ratan Tata launched the Nano, he made a tongue-in-cheek comment that it wouldn't give you sleepless nights. Was he right or was he wrong? Well, I, you know, the unfortunate thing is that too much gives me sleepless nights because the fact is that it's not just the nano, but it's all the cars coming onto the roads, which should give all of us sleepless nights, not just me. In which case, let me put it like this. Do you see the nano and the potential increase in cars that it could herald as a miracle of manufacturing that brings cheap cars to millions? Or do you see it as a potential nightmare in the Indian situation because it could lead to uncontrolled pollution and urban congestion unless it's very carefully managed? Karan, this is always the Indian answer, both. Very clearly both. I mean, it is phenomenal to have a car like Nano on the roads. And I do believe that it is a technological miracle. He's broken all barriers of cost and affordability. Remarkable. But in the Indian circumstance, it's not just about the Nano, but all the cars which are going to ape the Nano and the numbers of cars on our roads. And the question that we have to ask is, cars cost us the earth. Can we afford it? And that's the question that I don't think Indians are asking enough. All right, let's break that up into two parts. Let's begin by looking at the potential problem an increase in cars could create. And then later in part two, look at the corrective measures necessary. And let's start with pollution. The October 8th issue of your magazine, Down to Earth, says, on a per passenger basis, a car emits two times more particulate matter that poses a serious health challenge compared to a two-wheeler and four times more compared to a bus. So is your starting position that any sharp increase in cars and vehicles on the roads is something you would not like to see? I think it's important, Karan, if I can get a few minutes on this and explain this. It's important for us to understand that cars in India have to be seen differently than cars in, say, New York or in Shanghai or even in, in London because there are larger numbers of cars there. The question in India is that we are getting cars because we are getting richer, but we are too poor to afford the regulation that we need for cars that they can afford, whether it is cleaner fuel, cleaner technology, checking the backside of every car so that your pollution is under control, making sure that you pay for parking, essentially making sure that you are rich enough not just to use the car, but also to manage the fallouts of using that car. And that's really the big issue for countries like India and the challenge for us to think, is the car the only way that we can have mobility? Given that concern, what would be the outcome if many of the people today in India who use two-wheelers were to upgrade themselves and buy the Nano instead? What impact would it have on pollution? Well, essentially two things. One, we must understand, particularly if you talk about the two-wheeler and car equation, the fact is the two-wheeler takes much less space on the road. So with the increase of cars, you essentially get more congestion. And if you get more congestion, your pollution can go up five times. And by the numbers of two cars on the road, be very clear, you live in Delhi, I live in Delhi. I would like to ask all your viewers across the country, just go out and smell your air. And if you cannot smell the toxins in your air, and if you don't understand that this is not just dirty air, but that this is going to do the worst things possible to your body, that's really, to me, the big issue with the, with the cars. Now, let me point out to you that the Pollution Control Board already claims that more than 50% of the 90 cities that it monitors have particulate matter levels that are already critical. Absolutely. If now you have an exponential increase of the number of cars on the roads and pollution goes up as a result, as you say, five times, what will be the impact on those cities? Horrendous. I mean, I cannot even begin to describe it in any scientific technical words. Just understand, it's horrendous. And please understand, they this is unlivable? about... They, they are practically becoming unlivable today. We just don't feel it because we somehow put aside the cost to health. If our children have asthma, we just think this is the cost of progress. If our, if our old can't breathe, we simply say, oh, you know, hawa kharaab hai, ab kya karein, ye to karna hi padega. But we have a choice. We must demand a choice. 
Now the problem is, of course, that no one can actually stop cars increasing. Yeah. As people become more wealthy, they want to buy cars. It's aspirational. So how do you respond to research done by the Economic Times, which says that in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, the Nano is 40% better than other cars. In other words, if cars are going to increase anyway, it's better that people should buy the Nano rather than other cars. It's a slight slay of hand, the figures, if I can just explain this. I mean, the fact of the matter is that they have compared car to car, not car to a two-wheeler, okay? The two-wheelers in India are the most efficient, fuel efficient. You know that a person gets 60 kilometers per liter in a, in a two-wheeler today, a car only at maximum will give you 22. So I think that's really not the debate in India. In other India. words, this research misses the point. I think this research really misses the point, and it's still looking at comparing apples to apples and I really want us to begin to ca to compare apples to oranges and perhaps we'll make something quite different out of it. Perhaps the most interesting comparison of apples to oranges is the fear people have of the diesel nano. They say that given the diesel emissions are far more toxic than petrol ones, do you believe there's a case for banning the diesel nano? I think there's a case of banning all diesel cars. Be very clear about this, Karan, and this makes me really mad. But the diesel no. nano in particular because of its price? Well, diesel nano and diesel cars, because be very clear, even a Mercedes-Benz owner who buys a Mercedes-Benz which costs 22 lakhs and above, but decides to run it on a fuel that is kept cheap because of the poor, it, they, you know, this is criminal in this country. This is a loophole. This is exactly my point. Government in India has become a mere puppet in the hands of industry. What about points made by people like Murad Ali Beg, the car expert, yeah. who say that your concern about diesel engines is misplaced because you're not taking on board the enormous strides and advances the modern diesel engine has made. He points out yeah. that today, 49% of all passenger cars in Europe as a whole and 69% in France specifically are diesel. Yes, absolutely. But Mr. Big is essentially playing with words because when he calls advanced technology, it requires fuel of 50 ppm and below of sulfur. We have 350 ppm of sulfur in our fuel. So let's be very clear. We are far away from what he calls clean fuel and clean technology. What you get is toxic emissions. Please understand this. Diesel emissions are carcinogenic. This is not just simply about some dirty air. This is about your and my health. And you're saying that, in fact, the modern diesel engine would be undermined in India because of the dirty diesel available. You cannot use a modern diesel engine because you have dirty diesel in India, and Mr. Baig knows that. What about the impact of the explosion in cars on our roads on traffic congestion? Surveys have been done which show that between 1997 and 2002, the average speed of a vehicle on the roads in Delhi has fallen from 27 kilometers per hour to 15 and I gather now in the next five years it's fallen down to 10. Absolutely. So in the next five years if you see a million and more nanos on the road not to mention the increase in all the other cars could we have virtual gridlock? Karen just look at Delhi. Delhi I you know often I'm accused of using Delhi as an instance but just because Delhi is the richest city of India we want all cities to become as rich as India. Delhi actually buys more cars than it buys two-wheelers now in in terms of the growth of cars today. But if you look at this city, 20%, and please believe me on this figure, 20% of this city is under roads. Which is enormous, actually. Which is enormous. I mean, just imagine any city where 20% of your land area, 10% of this city is under trees. And yet, traffic still doesn't move. And we have increased our road length by 20%. But the, the amount of cars on the road have gone up by 138%. And that's, I think, the big challenge for India. I'll give you another and instance. Can I, can I just before you go to a yeah. challenge, can I point yeah. out something? Your magazine Down to Earth says hmm. that, in fact, increasing roads is not an answer to the increase of cars because as the road capacity expands, traffic expands almost equivalently. Is that really proven? It's absolutely. I mean, many people have been to London. And if you think about the orbital in London, you know what it's called in London. It's called the the biggest, the country's biggest parking lot because no car moves there. And that's a four lane orbital ring road that they made around and London. And that's happening to normal roads in Delhi. And that's happening to normal roads in Delhi. I'll give you another instance of our inability to understand the scale that we need to deal with. When we built the highway between Delhi and Gurgaon, which is a four lane new modern highway, this is coming with a capacity of 1,60,000 vehicles in 2016. Do you know the number of cars on the road today on, on that highway? 
one lakh thirty thousand. In other words, well before 2016, we'd have exceeded the exactly. built-in capacity. Exactly. We've already exceeding it almost. So why do you expect that you will ever be able to keep up? with the demand for infrastructure. This is also about the mind frame. Oh, we'll build more roads, we'll build more highways, we'll build flyovers, now we'll build flyovers over flyovers. Not realizing that they'll all get filled up, you will actually have less ability to move as okay. cars come in. Let's take a break at that point, Sunita Narayan. You've sketched out for us what the nightmare scenario could be if corrective measures aren't taken. Now let's look at what are the measures that are necessary to prevent the nightmare happening. That's in a moment, see you after the break. Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with Sunita Narayan. Sunita Narayan, let's now talk about the corrective measures necessary to prevent an urban nightmare mm -hmm. as a result of the explosion of cars. To begin with, do you think the time has come to scrap the subsidization of diesel, the most polluting fuel of all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because what you're allowing is cheap and dirty motorization. I mean, and the government is losing on every liter of diesel that we use in our private cars. If politicians won't bite the bullet and scrap the subsidization of diesel, would it be a suitable alternative to sizably increase the excise tax on diesel cars? Oh, I think that's exactly what we are saying. We understand there's a loophole. We understand that politicians are helpless because diesel is kept cheap for agriculture. We know that cars are making use of that loophole. So we are simply telling government increase the excise duty. But I will bet you, Karan, that's something the government doesn't have the guts to do because industry will never let it. Well, we have a budget coming up in February. Let's wait and see. Would you say a second important step is to charge realistic fees for parking. For instance, in Washington, parking for a day costs $15. It's $30 in New York. It's 10 rupees in Delhi. You know, current it's always amazing for me that we are allowing cars to come in without any of these regulations. I mean, just think, you and I, we go hunting for office space. We need a desk. We know how expensive it is to get that desk space. And yet, the car uses 23 square meters of space, 23 square meters of space. Just to give you a comparison, a juggi, a, a slum dweller's house takes 15 square meters of space. So just tell me why is it that we are not charging for that parking at the rates of real estate? Your organization, CSC, a few years ago suggested that parking fees in Delhi should be increased to at least 120 rupees a day. Is that we, something you stand by? Well, we basically calculated the cost of providing that parking. And if you look at these multi-level parking lots that are coming up as an alternative, you essentially find to recover the cost you re need to pay 30 rupees an hour. So we, we tried to give a slight sort of subsidy to urban dwellers and say 120 and a day. But we know how difficult it is to get something like that. Do you think Delhi and perhaps Bombay need to go one step further? Do they need to emulate London and Singapore and charge congestion charges for motorists who insist on driving into the most congested part of town? Well, I think if you were to increase your parking rates, you would essentially have a high congestion tax. But if I can take us to another issue, which I think is equally important, and that's really the, you know, what I call the mental barrier to change, because these are all, you know, regulatory issues, but you can only have regulation if you believe that you can do things differently. When we brought in CNG into Delhi, everybody accused us saying, you cannot have CNG because nowhere in the world has it happened. We said this is a leapfrog technology. Now, the leapfrog that I am presenting is, you have cities in India where essentially large numbers of people drive by bus, not by car. Please understand this, 60% of this richest city of India actually drives by bus. The car moves less than 10% of the people, occupies almost 70% of the road space. Now the question is, can you reinvent that by essentially saying, I will not go through the car route, I will jump straight through the most affordable, Absolutely. most convenient public transport system. Absolutely. What you're suggesting, therefore, is a two-fold strategy. On the one hand, you're saying, discourage the use of cars and thus take them off the roads without banning them and encourage people by giving them incentives to use public transport. The problem is that you can only do the two together, you can't do them one after another and at the moment today public transport in India is neither reliable nor is it extensive, for some it's not affordable and certainly it's not efficient. How does the government give us the sort of public transport we need so that we would be incentivized to take a bus or the metro rather than want a car? 
if I can just be very blunt about this, by stop talking about it and by doing something on it. Let's be very clear. We are talking about a transition. We are not talking about adding a few buses onto Delhi's roads. We are talking about a transition of a scale that has never been done in the world. The government can, can do I, can one thing very can simply. You say act, don't talk. But what is the action needed beyond the simple answer of throwing more money at the problem? What are the specific steps? Three things, if I could say. One, get your taxes right. Today, a car pays less tax than a bus does. And it in should the, be the other way around. And it should be the other way around. It's much more fuel efficient. It uses less space. It's much better for the environment. It provides access and mobility to a large Second. number of people. Second is make sure that you restructure your bus agencies because your biggest challenge today is your bus agencies are inefficient. Focus on it. Spend money on it. Spend time on it. Third, let the politicians believe that this is the big ticket answer for India. That is not the arm army which will which will drive a car. The arm army will be most benefited when you improve public the transport. Third, perhaps, is the most difficult because that's really where the mindset change you talked about exactly. a moment ago comes into play. Exactly. How do you convince politicians that not just the future of India, but rewards for them and their careers? lie in tackling the traffic problem of all Indian cities. How do you convince them? I think you convince them by the sheer logic of what's happening around you. Let's be very clear. Which politician can take pride of building a flyover today? Which politician can say that they've done something for the country when large numbers of their own city people don't, don't even have the money to take a bus can or I actually drop, bicycle Can I drop and say why I'm skeptical politicians would actually respond the way you want? Because most politicians don't suffer from traffic problems. Ministers, the Prime Minister, the President drive through with convoys. The road is stopped for them. The traffic is cleared. You and I stand and suffer. They just sail past. They probably have no idea what traffic congestion means. No, undoubtedly. And the tragedy of India is the tragedy of New Delhi in some senses because it is an India which is not in India. I mean, Lutain's Delhi or Luton's Delhi, as you may want to call it, is one place in the world which will never have a traffic jam. But I think there is much more to this, Karan. I think my question is also to industry. Which Indian industrialist who has stood in front of their fanciest of cars has ever come out to you and said, I will make the cheapest, most affordable, most convenient bus. And I will stand in front of it and I will tell all of India that this is the way for mobility. So to you're all. saying to Ratan Tata, it's not the nano car India needs, although many Indians do need it, Absolutely. and it's a boon, but what India needs is the nano equivalent of the bus. Well, he's also in the bus business, and I think he can be all our heroes if he was to now put his attention into making that bus which will drive not just a small part of India and will create all the congestion and the pollution, but will drive large parts of India and will do so at least risk to our health. So you're saying to Ratan Tata today, I appreciate the nano car, but I would value you much more. I'd consider you a much bigger hero if you produced the nano bus that would make public mobility cheaply possible and environmentally friendly for hundreds of millions, not just tens of millions. And I will add to it in the most convenient way. I want to make sure that that bus breaks all barriers of class. You do not want a okay. bus which is a rickety, dirty bus, which is not air conditioned. The best you possible. You want the best possible bus. You want it to be efficient. You want to make sure that your city can do this in a way that no other city in the world okay. other than Singapore. Ratan Tata might not have caused you sleepless nights. Maybe what you're saying today is going to cause him a little loss of sleep himself. But let me end by putting it like this. Ratan Tata has made the people's car possible for tens, maybe hundreds of millions of Indians. But those people are not going to be able to use the people's car without needless suffering and pain unless the government responds and manages the situation. Isn't that right? No, absolutely. But I think also if we as Indians start having pride in thinking that we can do things differently, large part of India will not drive the car. They will drive the bus. Very quickly, because we have just 10 seconds. Are you an optimist that the government will bite this bullet, or are you a pessimist? Oh, I'm absolutely an optimist, Karan. I believe the crisis is too big. We will have to find the answers. There is no doubt in my mind. Sunita Narayan, a pleasure talking to you. I'm Thank you,